stand-up comedian. Uh, Abdul went to on to write, perform for sh shows on major Middle Eastern TV networks and worked as a video editor at Al Jazeera English in Doha, Qatar. He is passionate about his visual arts and studied improv at Second City in the U.S., which is awesome. Um, Montgomery is a is a senior at the University of South Dakota, North Dakota, sorry, pursuing a dual degree in uh, B.S. Elementary Education, MS in Indigenous Language Education. As a former medic in the U.S. Navy, he has harnessed his public service skills by working tirelessly in promoting Indigenous language and customs with Indigenous youth while helping veterans transition into utilizing their leadership abilities to serve their communities. Montgomery is also a leader in movements for Indigenous rights and freedoms through nonviolent direct actions and rallies, organizing sobriety walks, runs, while lobbying for inclusive policies and laws at local and state governments. I have seen Montgomery in action. And Sandra is a Western New York native uh, with 30 plus year career in the US Army, beginning in 1981 as a combat medic, then journeying through various skill sets, including being a WMD specialist in theater security cooperations before retirement in October, 2015. Sandra has been a volunteer peer mentor with the Saratoga County Veterans Peer Connections within the Joseph P. Dwyer program since March, 2013. She is also co-chair co-chairs the Veterans Mental Health Council at the, at the Stratton VA. Uh, Sandra, you're, you're what we call, we, we'd call a lifer, right? In the military. Um, and then Jose, Jose M. Rios is a U.S. Army veteran who served 11 years in uniform in both an active duty and reserve component, including a tour in, of duty in support of Operation Desert Shield, Operation Desert Storm, which is the first Gulf War. Jose has a Master of Business Administration degree and a Master of Philosophy degree in Information Studies. He is currently a PhD candidate at the Palmer School of Library and Information Sciences at Long Island University. He currently serves as the Program Director for the Staff Sergeant Fox Veteran Suicide Prevention Program at Black Veterans for Social Justice in the bedford Stuy section of Brooklyn, New York. Jose also serves as a co-facilitator for the Veterans Action Group at Black Veterans for Social Justice and is the finance officer at American Legion Post 269 in New York. Okay. So the objectives quickly for this presentation are we want to, I'm gonna get rid of this, there we go. is to develop deeper understandings of military culture and the common and divergent identities and experiences which impact their living so better, their lives as veterans, particularly, uh, particularly formerly enlisted personnel. We wanna demonstrate an awareness of the oppressive and dehumanizing nature of military service in order to inform social work practice with veterans. We want to assist non-veteran service providers to not make certain assumptions about veterans in order to recognize them as a diverse and complex community of human beings, not a monolith. And to understand the importance of humanizing and empowerment-based approaches to micro, mezzo, and macro practice with veterans and their families. So, there's a pivotal, pivotal stage in our journey to becoming a veteran. Uh, it's when we we took an oath to the U.S. Constitution. We That's where we start. Well, we get recruited first, and then we take our oath, and then we go to MEPS, and then we go to training and such. But the indoctrination begins even when we're being recruited. Um, subsequently, we, we endured a rite of passage that indoctrinated us into a distinctive institutional culture based on a common identity, sense of purpose, and belonging grounded in traditions and norms that determine how we think, behave, communicate, and relate to one another and the outside world. We were trained to embrace the military value, values of courage, honor, loyalty, duty, and self-sacrifice. Yes, that is the army <laughs> part, and each branch has their own piece when it comes to that last part. Now, sorry.
Well, ultimately, military culture is deeply dehumanizing, requiring service members to assimilate to a way of being that requires this to forgo our individual social and cultural identities, instead told that we are all green. Be obedient to an authoritarian command structure or to authoritarian command structures by reflexively, without thinking, following orders and relinquishing critical thinking and independent thought. We give up our personal freedoms and deprioritize our family relationships. We dehumanize and engage in horrific acts of violence against anyone who is deemed to be the enemy and be willing to die or become permanently disabled, often for duplicitous, duplicitous political and economic agendas. Simply, US military culture is inherently violent and jingoistic. And finally, we participate in a culture rooted in racism, misogyny, heteronormativity, and gender normativity. Sorry, here we go. And just, just touch on some of these. So racism isn't, isn't in, the, in the military persists, right? Desegregation happened, yes, it didn't end there. And just like in the US with many things. Um, so these are recent articles. Again, it's well documented how racism is deeply rooted. And these are these are mainstream, this, you know, um, publications, and there's much, and there's many more out there and studies. Um, and just a piece of the racism, I mean, racism in many ways, it often, it, it means that certain people are, th that black, brown, indigenous people are usually passed over promotion um, more often, as well as uh, in, re are targeted for disciplinary actions compared to white service members. And also oftentimes, um, are dis disproportionately uh, have bad discharges that then in that then inhibit them from being able to access VA benefits. And then the VA has its own problems with racism. It's ongoing. These are recent, and it's um, so. And then there's also the epidemic of military sexual violence, assault, as MSA. Um, and it's it's pervasive and it it crosses genders and that's what the research bears out and again this is just you know kind of touching on these are, are examples of the the internal violence within the military that people are subjected to um as well as what we m might face with you know through the rigors and and um of, of our training and then if we get deployed in combat zones but overall, many veterans know these dehumanizing dimensions of military service all too well, while also valuing other aspects of their service, which altogether shape their post-service lives in a multi multitude of ways. See, it gets it gets complicated, right? Our veteran identities, we can, you know, there's there can be a lot of ambivalence, but then there's also it, it becomes very embedded in who we are um, to various degrees, depending who we are. So moving into the first question for our panel, um, everyone can see that. How, well, I'm not gonna assume that. How did you, the first question is, how did you experience dehumanization in the military and how did you cope or adapt to it in order to maintain your social, cultural identities and humanity, i.e. morals, ethics, values? Uh, so when the panelists want to jump in on that, and then we'll go through it and take turns. Yeah, Tim, I can start if you want. Sure. <clears throat> so for me, um, the dehumanizing experience occurred in basic training, right? Um, for a couple of reasons. Um, for one, I was scared, right? Um, Number two, I, I had never traveled to the South, so I didn't know what I was getting myself into. Um, I can actually remember um, getting off the bus and the parade grounds at Fort Jackson, South Carolina, and the drill sergeant telling us, you have five minutes to get off my bus. Three minutes are already gone. All I want to see is elbows and you know what. So I jumped off onto the parade ground and I'm thinking to myself, what the hell did I just get myself into? 
Additionally, you know, I lost my identity. I was no longer an individual. I was not part of a team. Um, you know, I, I lost my civilian clothing, you know, wearing the U.S. Army uniform. And then, of course, you know, I even lost my identity in the con in the context of my hairstyle, right? I had to wear this funny-looking GI-issued um, haircut. The dehumanization occurred in basic training. And sometimes people say to me that, um, you know, I'm, I'm suffering from undiagnosed PTSD because... You know, 38 years later, I'm still wearing my dog tags. Um, for years after I got out of basic training, I was making my bed with hospital corners. To this very day, I sleep with a U.S. Army wool blanket on my on my bed. I almost called it a bunk, right? And then for um, several years um, after I, I left the Army, I was sleeping on a U.S. Army cot. And the hospital quarters thing ended when a friend of mine came to visit me and she saw my bed neatly made with the hospital corners where you can literally bounce a quarter off of it, right? And she rips all of the linen off the bed. She says, you're no longer in the army. So from that point on, you know, I said to myself, well, I guess I'm no longer in the army. And I started making my bunk a little differently. But the, dehumaniz the dehumanizing aspect um, occurred in basic training. And the way I dealt with it was, you know, I, I, I tried to play the game, right? We all know what that means. I, I tried to be the, the best soldier possible so that um, I can keep the drill sergeant's eyes off of me so that I wasn't, you know, yelled at, cursed at, and asked to do extra push-ups and things like that. I tried to be the best on the rifle range, even though that was the very first time I ever picked up a weapon. I tried to be the best at, you know, tossing grenades down range, even though that was the first time I ever tossed a grenade down range. And I was terrified of doing these things because I had never shot a rifle before and I had never um, deployed a grenade down range. So to this very day, you know, basic training for me was 38 years ago. And I still remember some of these things. And I can also remember distinctly, um, I was 24 years old going through basic training. So I was a little older than the normal recruits and the drill sergeants would refer to me as old man. <laughs> so that's just some of the dehumanizing aspects that I remember from basic training. Thank you, Jose, appreciate that. To oh, caveat good. off of that, I could say, you know, there was a certain amount of dehumanization that we have to deal with when we come out of service with regards to even really having to deal with the VA in certain instances, with regards to being seen and heard with regards to, say, your disability claim and things of that nature. Um, I'm not going to go into too much detail about my personal experiences of dehumanization because that could take all day. Uh, but what I can say is how I was able to deal with that being a, as Jose mentioned, I was on the older end as well. I went in at 28, had already had my degree, already really set in life and chose to go and enlisted because I had intended to stand for about a decade, you know, transfer to OCS and ride it out. Um, that didn't exactly happen the way I had intended. They say you're not supposed to tell people what you really want to do because you're not going to get it. But how I did at the end of the day really manage to deal with all of these dehumanization issues was falling into uh, meditation. Uh, I had found going into the military and basic training, Buddhism, actually, uh, having been raised in the church, learned too much and know too much about religion as a whole, it was something, it was an opportune moment for me to turn uh, inward, to be self-reflective and to really meditate on what it is I'd got myself into and how long I was about to be in it. Uh, so I could say that meditation uh, was of great service. And then later in it, I volunteered a lot. I found giving back while I was in it uh, served me. It proved to be a certain therapy and it kept me keeping my mind uh, focused while I was enveloped in an environment that wasn't always so supportive or uh, and oftentimes just aggressive unnecessarily. Uh, so I volunteered a great deal until I actually was awarded the Volunteer Service Medal. So I found truly being selfless in that environment helped and saved me and earned me uh, some, some place of focus. Hi, this is Sandra. Um, my experience was very, um, I was in boot camp 43 years ago. 
And when I first came a part of that, I was identified as a reject from the planet uterus. But when we went through, it was a matter of being told they were going to break you down and build you up. So even though it was awkward and with the fact of spending my summers down in Alabama, Mississippi during the 60s, it was always, always taught that as long as I had it in my head, couldn't nobody take it away. So all I did was sort of adapt and just tried to be good at what I did and go from there. And then the other problem I had was is that, yeah, you know, I was more or less uh, marginalized by being female. You know, it was a matter of there was only two types of females in the military, dykes or bitches. They wouldn't know which one was I, you know, so I got that harassment. But again, because of how I was raised, I was able to ignore it and just kind of sort of stayed away from it. But it did make it difficult, but I just sort of internalized it and used it as a secret weapon to continue to stride to what I wanted to do. And because I also broke the trend, I scored high on my ASVAB so I could pick any career. So I never chose anything that was statistically or demographically considered African-American. That, that. So I was not a cook. I was not a supply person. I was medical and got to do other things, which aggravated people to where it got to be a point of trying to attack me based on the intelligence. Oh, you're not as smart as you think you are. But I just used it as a stepping stone. It did wear me down. And I, uh, I throughout the years, did obtain a lot of anger. But I learned to balance it by not giving them what they wanted. So that's how I dealt with it. Sandra, can I cut in and ask if you are purposely having your phone turned away from you? Um, some of, if possible, some of okay. the abuse members would love to see you. If not, okay. hold, hold on. No, no. The thing is, I'm not sure. I've been trying to set this up. And okay, no, no worries. Don't, don't, don't. If it's not broken, don't fix it. We'd rather have you present here than lose you because we're trying to toggle an image. Oh, just I turn it around. Know. We're just turned around. Just turn it around. Just is turn it turned it around, around now? Nope, just flip the turn the phone around. I'm sorry, Scott. I'm sorry, Tim. There How's we go. That? There we go. All right. All right. <laughs> yeah, I've been right. fighting with internet issues, so I do apologize because it's a little awkward. But yeah. I am here. Thank you, Sandra. Appreciate that. And Melanie, appreciate you too. Um okay. Montgomery, Abdul. Oh, yeah, I can go next, Tim. Um for me, the experience of dehumanization, um, it started before I was born. Uh, I am Hunk Papa Lakota from the Ocheti Shakoin lands in the Midwest, um, North and South Dakota, as well as into Colorado and Nebraska are traditionally my territorial lands. So before I was born, um, a lot of indigenous people already went through a lot of dehumanization activities and atrocities throughout U.S. history. So when I was born into it, um, you know, my parents, they survived uh, boarding school. I'm not sure if you are all too familiar with um, the atrocities that happened there. But, um, you know, I grew up in a home that was consistently in survival mode. So the, the the you know the skills that we develop in order to survive in order to cope and to adapt to you know I, I hate to use life or death situations but you know we have to eat you know we have to survive we have to have a home over our head so you know learning how to adapt and you know maybe miss a meal here and there or you know maybe wear the same clue, the same clothes for two years and, you know, shoes that don't fit for another year after that. And, uh, you know, developing those skills as a teenager, <clears throat> I went into service when I was 20 years old and, you know, my parents live off the reservation and on the reservation, but I spent quite a lot of time away from the reservation and I wasn't able to connect with my heritage and to, uh, learn what my identity was. And so when I was in high school, um, I met with a Marine recruiter and we discussed options about active service and those things. And, you know, luckily for me, I figured out I didn't like eating crayons when I was in elementary, so I didn't go that route. But I ended up uh, joining the Navy. And so when I joined the Navy, uh, I was looking for my identity. 
And that's what my search was for. So when it came time to, you know, your boots on the ground, you're being fully immersed and indoctrinated, as you said, Tim, uh, for me, it was just, uh, just another part is just, I'm just trying to survive. And that's all I know. So I didn't, at that time, I didn't really have an identity per se. I was still a young man. Um, you know, my, my humanity, I didn't really recognize that in myself. Uh, as far as morals and ethics and values and things of that nature, you know, I had like what my grandparents taught me, you know, to be compassionate, uh, care for others, you know, being in that family environment, we learned to share what we have, you know, uh, I can't tell you how many times my older brother stole all my hoodies, you know, even though they were 30, 40, 50 pounds heavier than me, but, you know, those are the things that you learn kind of growing up. And so, um, you know, throughout my experience, it, it just varied. Uh, command to command. I think, um, you know, my first command was predominantly white. Uh, and the only BIPOC people, <laughs> BIPOC personnel, we all worked in, um, we all worked in sick bay. So I think how I learned to cope, you know, just like a lot of other veterans is you just, you learn how to keep your head down. And, um, you know, I did notice that a lot of people who did come from more well-off backgrounds, I think that they excelled a lot more. And of course, you know, there were other folks too who who benefited uh, from, from a certain skin color. But, you know, if I had to go back and do it again, you know, like many of the majority of us, you know, I probably would go ahead and do that as well. But coping and adapting, I think those skills were developed as a teenager, uh, even well into adulthood. So um, I'll share a little bit more with your next question, Tim, but I just want to touch a little bit more on just my culture, identity, and uh, my humanity as far as this question pertains. I, it, it's all very relevant. And um, and and just to just note, there's that indigenous people uh, with, with, within the borders, so-called United States, right, are have often been the highest serving ethnic group. And certainly, there's a they're close to half, or maybe a little under, of of um, the, on various Lakota reservations, uh, serve in the are, are serving the military and are veterans, right? So a large proportion, almost half, generally, give or take, within from reservation reservation. Do you know why that? Is, I mean, why is that from your perspective? Um, from my learning of our traditional knowledge and our way of life, um, being a warrior is part of your coming of age. So we had different, uh, ceremonies and practices as well as protocols. Uh, just to give you a brief timeline, 13 to 14, you would typically go on the war path and, and our, and I can only speak for Dakota, Lakota, Nakota people, Ocheti, Shakomi bands. Um, I can only speak for us because all the tribes all vary. They have their own way of doing things. They have their own historical um, uh, values and protocols, things of that nature. But for us at 13 or 14, you went on your first hunt by yourself. Um, you would go at the war party. And our way of life, it was valued higher in battle to count coup. Counting coup meant that you went up to your enemy say we're riding on horseback, right? You know, this is uh, 1700s, 1800s. We're riding on horseback and we're going head to head in battle. Well, if I ride by you and I tap you on the shoulder, on the head, on the leg with a stick, uh, that shows restraint, that shows respect for life. And that obviously uh, gives testament to your character that you have the social, emotional uh, capabilities to recognize the importance of life. But on the flip side, obviously, you know, we don't all get along. And, uh, you know, when we did go to war, it wasn't just something uh, done. It, we didn't do it in a playful manner. We didn't do it to better ourselves. It typically was always done in self-defense. And to be a protector for a male, it was held high. That meant that you took care of your household. Um, we are not measured by what we can accumulate, but you are measured by what you can give away. So the people that have the highest character and the highest stature in our bands, uh, in our, you know, our communities, 
they were the people that were typically the poorest. So if you were a good warrior, a great hunter, you know, you went out and you did the best that you could do in order to help others. So self-service and servitude to your community was one of the, uh, it was one of the utmost, uh, the highest uh, achievements that you could aim towards in life. Again, thank you, Montgomery. Abdul. Yes, hello everybody, um, I'm Abdul. Um, I guess when it comes to dehumanization for me, I mean, definitely as an Arab American, um, kind of it started, you know, post 9-11, um, you know, pre 9 11. I mean, I'm going to put some jokes here just because like I, my background is a stand up comic and that's how I deal with stuff most of the time. So, you know, pre 9 11, you know, the worst you can think is kind of like, you know, Aladdin jokes or, you know, maybe like Indiana Jones villains or whatnot. And then post 9 11, you know, you're in some communities or some areas you walk or whatever it is, you're, you're, you're kind of deemed as a uh, local threat. Right. Um, and then, you know, Fast forward to 2018, 2019, when I enlisted, I was uh, 30 and I was walking kind of into the belly of the beast, not really knowing exactly what to expect. And, um, you know, blessed to go in older and also with a degree at the time kind of gave me that um, more of like outside of the box or, to, you know, that ability to zoom out in certain situations and kind of, you know, from the beginning, understand that it's almost like, you know, the politics in it is kind of like a, you know, a game. Um, now, and that, you know, helped me in a lot of ways to cope with certain stuff, but every now and then I'll be challenged in a certain way where, you know, I'll, I'll have to either deal with the emotions that are inside or, or maybe like even, you know, speak out publicly uh, about something that I see that, I feel it's um, not quite right. I remember the first time was during basic training. It was, you know, we had to do kind of like um, combat exercises out in the field and we were doing it. And this is like post, you know, the post Iraq war. And um, I remember like we had to do this thing and we had to like, you know, go and get, you know, contact the enemy and the enemy were basically two um, soldiers and one of them, and also one drill sergeant that were wearing burqas. Um, and, you know, like uh, a thobe, Arabic thobe or dish dash. And um, I remember I finished, you know, that experience, but then I go and sleep that night, something in me didn't feel quite right because, you know, at any, you're, when you're in the army, you're expecting to be also in any theater, depending where it is. It's not just one territory, one geography. And then at the same time, also, um, maybe because I'm in my 30s and experienced a lot, I can understand not to take this and start, you know, um, stereotyping other people and cultures and whatever it is. But when you look at 17, 18 year olds, and this is their first experience, you kind of, you know, you're really thrown that image. And I had to speak to my drill sergeant on this side and tell him like, Hey, this is what happened. And I don't understand because even culturally, usually, you know, like when you're in that combat area, you know, it's kind of, these are not always the images that you're going to see, or you're going to, you know, and um, confront. And also, I mean, what do you think about um, soldiers um, who, you know, leave and and after they discharge uh, and then, um, you know, they walk in the streets in certain community and they see like people that are ethnically, you know, wearing what they usually wear, but they're also Arab Americans. You don't know if something can get out of hand or not. So like, this is a responsibility that we're putting on these, you know, on these people. And his answer was that, you know, it's, these are just orders. This is the stuff that they gave me for this training. It's from higher up. We can't do anything about it. Right. And, um, so, and then also going to some areas where there's like, there's religious services for almost every um, every belief you can find, but then also you'll find like, there's no, you know, area for like Islam, like, you know, for um, Islam. And, and then also like when you're in training, you'll find, for example, you know, lots of Christians having like for each faith or Christian domination, you'll find like there's a service on Sundays or whatever it is. But then when a, a Jewish soldier, for example, wants to practice, you know, on, on Saturday, they can't because there's training. So you can't do that. And also when you're going to have to out eat meals in the field, especially during training exercise and certain exercises, there's no meals that are, you know, some, a lot of times there's no kosher meals, there's no halal meals, and you're just going to have to, you know, eat what the other soldiers eat. Now, there might be like no pork at certain times, but certain times like you know, it depends on your drill sergeant, how accommodating, whatever it is, you know, how, how it's going to be. So I think in that regards, at least, I mean, these are some hints at it, but also, you know, another thing about dehumanization, just being also an older 
uh, guy going in as a lower rank, you know, as a specialist, and then I'm having to deal with sergeants and chain of command that are, you know, within like rank wise, they're ahead of me, but they're probably like 24, 25 years old. And then also, you know, there's, there's that kind of, um, I wouldn't say conflict, but there's also them approaching me. They don't know how to approach because I'm at a certain, you know, I'm older. So sometimes they can be intimidated by it on the get-go before anything happens. And then they just feel like they have to prove a point by putting you down early on. So yeah, th these are some of the experiences um, and just, yeah, coping with it and, and trying to adapt with it was, you know, you, you try to find safe havens. You try to sometimes pray at certain times where nobody's watching, or sometimes you're going to have to skip it. Um, also when you, you get, you get trainings or briefings and they give a lot of examples or they talk about, you know, terrorist threats and you have to do that yearly training of, you know, uh, how to know is there a terrorist around you and whatever. And you find a lot of the examples are, um, peoples of color, you know, doesn't, you know, doesn't matter whether they're like, you know, Muslim, Arab, um, Asian, Latino, and, and then you're like, you just have to deal with it because it's, it's the system. This is how it is. And you just, you know, have to do it. But just thinking about the long-term effects of it, that's, yeah, that's, that's kind of worrying at times. Yeah. And, and, and as you're talking, I'm just thinking about um, how just common it was with, within, within all branches, you know, who were deployed during the, the, the war on terror um, to, to, to refer to the dehumanizing term Haji that was used a lot again. Yeah. Um, all right, so moving on to the next question. And so I, I want to open this question up too to the panel, and but also when you know, there's probably a lot of a lot of thoughts and feelings coming up um, based upon our initial discussion on uh, you know just throughout this panel and the first question and going to the second one. So please feel free to you know go back and forth between them or add additional kinds of of, of your thoughts and feelings on 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 certain aspects that is not being asked, but within the themes of this this panel presentation. So question two, anyone want to take that first? I'll go. Great. Okay. In my case, I kind of sort of started just before I separated because as I got toward the end, I had an idiot write me up for having gray hair. And it got to the point where it's like, it's time to go. And I was smart enough that because they were doing things and I was starting to blow up, I actually reached out to the VA and I started with doing yoga. And then I got a behavioral health specialist that kind of sort of helped me navigate because I had so much anger that I had no tolerance for anybody's stupidity. And it was like, I was at 1000. So if somebody did what I thought was stupid, I was already at 1001 already to where I could feel it in my body, like my scalp was sliding and everything. And I realized that if I did not get that under control, I ran the risk of losing my retirement. And if I lost retirement, it meant that I would not have any livelihood. And so I started using yoga, using the provider. And I even, we kind of sort of had a challenge with each other. Um, but they responded in such a way that they earned my trust. Um, they are younger than I am. They are also ethnically different than I am, but they had a compassionate heart and they have a strong ear. So with that in mind, that's how I was able to navigate it because I had remembered my grandfather saying that everyone you encounter can teach you something. So I was willing to try to learn what else I could do to become a better me because I have forgot, I had really believed that I had lost my identity and that I really had no worth. And so it was a matter of trying to build that back up to feel that I am worthy of the things that I earned. Sandra, thank you. 
sorry, there's dogs here. Um, yeah, that's really significant stuff. I appreciate you sharing that. Um, does anyone else want to go next? And then, then we can, you know, feel free to start talking to each other too, panelists. Uh, Tim? Hi. Tim? Yes. Yeah. Yes, hi. Hi, so Jose. Um, so looking at this question, after being separated from the military, how'd you go about reclaiming and further developing the wholeness of your humanity as you define it? When I separated from basic training, right, um, I, the, one of the first things that I said to myself was, what do I do now? Because I was so accustomed to the structure, to the regimentation of, of being on active duty. It was almost like I was lost for, for several months. But then, you know, I started reflecting on my military experience and I said, you know, I, I, I was treated in a certain way, I think basically because of the color of my skin, because I came from New York. So, you know, New Yorkers are supposed to be tough. So they're going to be the first at doing this. They're going to be first on the grenade range. They're going to be the first on Victory Tower, Slide for Life, all that stuff. Um, so then I, I said to myself, you know, really realistically thinking, right? You know, I'm, I'm grateful for the experiences that I, that I saw um, while I was on active duty with the U.S. Army, because essentially the Army set the tone for the rest of my life. Mm -hmm. and, and what happened is because uh, what happened is I sort of became like, like Beckton said earlier, a selfless individual and wanting to give back and sort of living my life um, under the uh, umbrella of the U.S. Army Soldiers Creed. You know, mm -hmm. I, I will never leave a fallen comrade. So I, I think um, that sort of mindset helped me to do the things that I do in civilian life today. Right. Helping others that are less fortunate than me. There before the grace of God go I. Um, serving U.S. military veterans, because for me, that is an honor. And in a certain way, right, continuing to serve, right, by helping U.S. military veterans and um, holding an officer's position uh, with American Legion Post 269 in Patchogue, New York. So essentially, you know, um, it's hard for me to say that, you know, I, 38 years later, I've separated myself from the Army entirely. I don't think I have. I, I, I say to myself that um, I think I'm probably going to be an Army soldier on, until the day I die. I mean, I, I like to think that I've become more selfless. I like to think that I've become more of a humanitarian as a result of serving in the military. I like to think that I've become more compassionate. And I like to think that I can work well with others as a result of being on, on a team within the U.S. within the U.S. Army. So that's that's the way I think I reflect on, on this question. You know, and, and going back to the first question, right, um, I think some of it, could you go back to the first question a second, Tim, if you don't mind, if you can indulge me? Okay, so I, I think some of it deals with how did you cope with it, right? Um, some of the ways that I cope with it, right, was um, writing letters home. I think, you know, getting letters from family and friends was really the coolest thing and, you know, being a, a civilian again, right? 1986, basic training for Jackson, South Carolina, there were no cell phones. So, you know, we had morale, morale calls or we paid for calls on our own when we were off duty. And one of the things that I can remember is that you know, those of you that uh, served in the army or in the military know that you probably only have five minutes for a shower in the morning to do the mm -hmm. three S's. So what I would do is I would I would bribe the fire guard and, and ask him, you know, to uh, wake me up at 3.30 a.m. instead of 4.30 a.m. so that I can get into the uh, latrine and have, you know, 45 minutes to an hour so I can feel like a civilian again until the drill sergeant found out about that. And he uh, he ended that rather quickly. But uh, those are the things that I remember. Um, yeah, and I, I, I do have a background in harm reduction. I, I, I've been working in harm reduction off and on for the past 13 years. And again, that's the way of me giving back and serving as a change agent. Because, um, you know, like I said earlier, I, I'm going to be a soldier for the rest of my life. I'm going to give back. I'm going to be my, my duty uh, to others is going to be selfless in nature. So thank you very much. Mm -hmm. oh, wow. Yeah. Powerful stuff. Thank you, Jose. Becton, it seems like you want to jump in there. You got something to say. Yeah, I do. Thank you, Jose. You know, once a soldier, always a soldier. And I'm sitting here really contemplating exactly how I have changed in my existence as a Black man in these here United States of America. Have been my whole life, was Black when I joined the military and dealt with all of that then. 
which was a big part of why I had to focus so much on my mental gymnastics and going inward and meditating. Because even at the beginning, I should have known better when I tested into psychological operations, which is exactly what I wanted, and then they denied me. They did everything in their power to prevent me from doing what I was coming in to do. And I think often, had that not been the choice, had I been more cognizant of it, you know, had I fought more, what have you, had they followed up, I could still be in now doing the service of all services that I volunteered to come in and do. But I realized that my being Black in these United States of America doesn't change from me being Black in the United States Army. I just am wrapped in green. It didn't change much. It just really made uh, the reality of my choices more prominent. And it became imperative that I got myself out unscathed uh, because I didn't experience a lot of issues back until I was stationed stateside with American folk. I heard nigger time and time again over abroad, you know, but, you know, I hear that all over the place. But to come back here and be getting the second runarounds from my own people, that was the biggest problem. So what I had to do when I separated, you know, I've expressed time and time again that my joining and signing my life away as we did was both and simultaneously the best thing I could have ever done for myself and being the worst thing I could have ever done to myself. Because every issue that I am dealing with as a civilian 18 years later are still because of the choice I made to join to volunteer my life, to serve, to be selfless, honorable, duty, respectable, all these things. So coming back out of the military, I still have to have that same stance of meditating and breathing because I'm not allowed to be angry as a black man in America. I'm not allowed to have any disagreements. I'm not allowed to have thoughts. Um, so I'm not exactly sure necessarily how I've reclaimed well, that's not true. I just lied in front of all you people. I know exactly how I reclaimed myself. And that's when I truly pivoted and created my company, the Becton International Black Theater and Arts Consortium, where we can really focus on us individual people. Come to the Becton and find yourself so you can go into the world and be yourself. I found that in really falling back into my choice of study, well, I'm a professional performance artist. I turned down Broadway contracts because of compromise. I stopped dancing because of the wear and tear on the body. But then the military really put the wear and tear on my body that I can't even be considered a dancer anymore. But what I can say is using my experience to say how arts expression, experience into it is really of aid and service for all of us. I see, and particularly even for veterans, the artistic community is one welcoming area that we can all fall into. It really allows an individual, as I said, to find your soul, to find what's important to you so you can stand on your two feet and then sift through what the military has done to us and stand strong and powerful and stand to the front and lead from the front like we were conditioned to do. Thank you for that. Um, I guess, so for me, or for me particularly, um, being a veteran is something that I hold, I mean, I, I don't know how to say it in a certain way that it's, it's, it's kind of, I felt it's my rites of passage to being an American in the eyes of lots of Americans, right? Mm -hmm. um, because when I go, whether it's uh, into organizations, you know, institutions, meetings, interviews, whatever it is, you read just, you know, you read my name and then a lot of people might have an image or whatever it is, or, or you know, have a preconceived notion. And then, you know, once they figure out that and I, I feel like a lot of times I have to, you know, go ahead and say I'm a veteran and for them to, you know, kind of like put their guards down or whatever. It's like, oh, you served our country. And it's, it's, it's not... It's not that, you know, I'm using it like, yeah, I want to, you know, because I feel better or superior or anything like that. But it's just this is this is what's going to make me look, um, you know, this is what's going to get me, you know, proper treatment as an individual, let's say, or a fair treatment as an individual. Um, because, you know, going 
going in as an Arab, you know, and, or as a Muslim to a lot of people, you know, to like certain areas or certain states or whatever it is. Like for now, I live in Florida, you know, you can you can kind of see how at certain times, you know, it's, it's going to be dehumanizing the experience mm. itself. And I, I saw the change and you, you can and a lot of times you can see the change in, in the, the tone, the approach, the treatment itself, um, just by saying I'm, I'm, I'm a veteran. Um, and at the same time, um, I, when I go to the VA clinic, um, I do, I'm, I'm happy when I go and I actually, cause I know that it's, it's one of those experiences or like one of those areas where you go to and everybody else, regardless of background, culture, whatever it is, they all went through kind of the same experience and there's, there's, there's this commonality. So you kind of feel that there's this communal thing, regardless of political beliefs, religious faith, whatever it is, regardless if you actually saw me in the street and didn't know I was better than what you'd think, but going to the VA, you kind of feel like, yeah, we're all because of the same problems, same troubles. We went through that military experience. We got broken or, you know, what not, whatever it is, but, you know, we had that small struggle. And I, and I, and the reason why I like that feeling is because I feel at least, you know, because of that little piece of, you know, experience, I belong somewhere, you know? And um, when I got out, it took me a long time to find myself, you know, or find my place in this world. And I worked as a uh, photojournalist for a local TV news station in Florida. And um, I saw how certain news were being handled, you know, regard, you know, because regardless of or depending on where the news happened to a certain class or race or whatnot. And um, I and then the, out of nowhere, we were hit with this, you know, this news article, this reporter did about like FBI or um, warning people about, you know, uh, d domestic, uh, domestic terrorism or something like that, whatever it is, and being recruited. And, you know, at the time when that news came out, a lot of the domestic terrorism we're talking about was post, you know, the Capitol Hill and all that kind of stuff. And then, but the images that were being given were for 2013, 2014, the war on ISIS and, um, you know, just like people holding flags and all that kind of stuff from Iraq. And then I had to do, like, I had to confront them. I'm like, why are we talking about this right now when, you know, when this, like, we've moved on from this and I've, I've served in the military, I work amongst you and all that kind of stuff. And at the same time, we have to bring this up to the world. And um, of course I got an apology, HR mistake. We're so sorry. We're going to do like this, you know, inclusivity, diversity uh, talk. And we're going to bring this, you know, uh, representative from the Muslim community to give an example about how not to stereotype people in the news, which they had already done for almost every, uh, you know, every, every minority. And I'm like, okay, but then, you know, fast forward um, to what's going on right now in the Middle East, regardless of political stuff and whatever it is, but then, you know, you open, you, you get Fox News, you know, you get this person saying like, kill them all, or you get this, you know, this political representative saying also kill them all, I hope they all die or whatever is and all that kind of stuff. And that's, I think that's the most challenging part for me because it's just after that rights passage and after all that kind of stuff, you see... You, you you hear these words and you hear people like saying, like, for example, you know, if, if, if you're a Palestinian, if you're an Arab, like, you know, you're, you've never done anything good um, in your life and don't don't bring them here. Don't get refugees here. Don't get all that all that kind of stuff. And um, and just it's 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 it becomes something that I have to live with, which is even if I ever do get to belong, it's all circumstantial and it's all temporary. And um, right now being, you know, a veteran or a, a filmmaker, you know, being a fellow in the Writers Guild Foundation um, and, and, you know, going through the program, the Veterans Writing Project, helping screenwriters land on their feet. It's just I, I'm taking my coping is writing my own stories and trying to share them. But at the same time, also, I have to also within that hide either my identity or hide my story or hide my feelings about certain things, because if some people don't believe in them or, or if they might be, you know, too inflammatory to other people that might cancel my career or that might cancel whatnot. So I'm, I just have to face the fact that, you know, in, in, in the United States where I was born and I served, I will still have that, you know, chip on my shoulder that I have to live with. So regarding the wholeness of my humanity, I don't know how it, you know, I don't really know how it is because I can tell you, even if I was living in the Middle East also, I'm going to have also feeling, you know, I'm going to feel dehumanized also there in a lot of other ways that are very different from here culturally and all that kind of stuff. So it's just, you know, this just, I think, take for me, it's just taking a day at a time and just, you know, trying to every now and then remind myself that, you know, I'm in a better place than, you know, where 
like I have a home, I have, you know, I have all these blessings and just basically just count my blessings each day and just, you know, live with it. Yeah. Montgomery, what's coming up for you? Oh, uh, well, first of all, just want to thank the panels for opening up and being vulnerable. Uh, these questions are really hard to ponder on and have discourse, you know, but I think it's important to just acknowledge that because a lot of people, you know, that the first step and even, you know, moving on from that is, you know, that the moment that you heard and the moment that you feel seen, those are typically the moments that, um, you know, it begins to foster that, that healing process. And, it begins to open up new doors and avenues where you can express yourself. And I think it's really important. I know we spoke about it a little bit before in our previous meetings, how, you know, art can contribute, the self-expression can contribute to that, to, to opening up and really getting yourself out there and sharing yourself with the world because, uh, you know, and I'm just speaking that because my personal coping skills are just generally centered around bottling it up. And if you always have it inside and you can never get it out or express it, you know, well, you're going to explode at some point in time. But after being separated from the military, uh, I was still on a search for identity to reconnect with my uh, historical heritage. And how I went about reclaiming my humanity was essentially tapping into um, just any and everything that has to do with my Lakota culture, uh, whether that's ceremony, whether that's songs, whether that's art language, importantly, um, those are all key aspects of a culture. And if you lose any one of those at some point in time in your life, or even if you never had those, uh, if you never had those opportunities to indulge into that and to, really connect with it, then, you know, you're basically missing a piece of yourself still. So, you know, my wholeness, it basically came from going through our rites of passage, the things that historically we used to do, uh, you know, 1700s, you 13 to 14 years old as a man, you would go through your coming of age ceremonies, you would go humbletcha, which means to go cry for a vision, you would do four days, four nights, no food and water, uh, from there, you would do sun dancing, which is four days, four nights, uh, no food, no water. And you would go through these uh, spiritual ceremonies um, that really helped you connect with your peers around you, but also with Mother Earth, uh, really recognizing that you are just a part of the whole. You know, we always hear those interesting concepts of, you know, look up in the stars and you know, really recognize that you're, you're one of many. And, you know, my people, I guess just a quick uh, cultural lesson for you, but my people, we believe that we come from the stars. Uh, when we look up at Orion's belt, uh, you know, upside down, it's shaped like a triangle. You know, you got one point here, one point here, and then the point in the middle. Well, if you flip that upside down, it's in the shape of a teepee. And that's what we historically lived in. So we believed that the mother and the father made the child, which came down. And then you flip it, what's up is down and what's down is up. It would enter into the home and that would make you a part of the whole. So we believe that we're star people. We we come from the other side. So in, in my journeys of reconnecting and finding out who I am and uh, creating myself whole and really defining myself, figuring out my self-worth. I think, you know, reconnecting to my culture and, you know, I, I love what, uh, um, what Abdul said about, you know, praying, you know, I think a lot of that really helped out and how I explain to, uh, my students, I, I teach a lot of cultural classes, how I explain to my students, you know, like praying is just, you know, even if you don't identi identify with a specific religion or a spirituality, you know, we're always constantly releasing uh, energy. You know, you're always putting something out into the world and it could be good or bad. Uh, 
could be any one of the many emotions that we express. And, you know, I, I really, I really connected with what Abdul said, because, you know, I pray a lot, you know, I pray every day, I, I get up in the morning. So one of the first things I do, I go to bed at night, it's the last thing I do before I close my eyes. So, you know, just even not having that for so long in my life, you know, I couldn't imagine what it was like to be a service member. And, uh, you know, not having that space to be able to express yourself uh, in the matter that suits you the best that goes hand in hand with your belief. But, you know, connecting with uh, my culture and my spirituality, I think that really gave me a sense of direction in life of what I want to do to be an educator and to work with children. Um, you know, I think that's really what, you know, as Jose said, you know, it really pivoted me towards being a humanitarian towards, uh, continuing that selfless service. And I think that's really important for a lot of veterans. I think a lot of us, uh, we went in, you know, a lot of us, my, myself, you know, I joined, um, it, it was a phone call for me. I, <laughs> I was indulging in some recreational activities and, uh, 3 AM came around and I seen the Navy global force for good. So I made the phone call and, you know, I grew up in a big family, so you always served everybody. You always looked out, so it just seemed like second nature for me. And, um, you know, later in life, just continued to build on what I knew, uh, my my strengths, um, and that that is selfless service. So it, it's it's amazing to be a part of this panel, and it's amazing to be in this community. And um, I think it goes without saying that, uh, you know, we all we all took a oath. And a lot of times that transitions outside of service and, you know, really that oath I feel personally, and I don't want to speak for anyone else, but I feel that that oath that I took, it just extends to your fellow uh, human being, you know, it, it extends, um, you know, beyond the uniform that you wear. And I think that's really key for a lot of people because they're, you know, a lot of us just speaking, you know, about my peers, my fellow service members, a lot of them are educators, uh, you know, a lot of them going to social work, a lot of them are psychiat uh, psycho psychologists, psychiatrists, a lot of them work in arts, a lot of them work with the people, you know, uh, I, I could tell you endless stories about folks that work at nonprofits and give their free time and, you know, we're, food drive, food drives, jacket drives, any and everything that you can think of, you know, a lot of these folks, like they really still want to serve the community. So I think that's, uh, that's really important when it comes to reclaiming your humanity. You know, there's not a lot of resources out there for veterans when they transition. But uh, just for myself, you know, I just leaned on the ones that came before me. There's a lot of veterans in my community that, you know, they went to I think the oldest one in our community was um, Korea, Korea veterans. So, you know, I just leaned on a lot of their advice and, um, you know, they just help yourself by, they just told me, you know, help yourself by helping others. And that's where it starts. And there's a world of opportunity out there and it, it doesn't just stop at your doorstep. You know, you got to keep walking the walk and talking the talk, but it really does, um, you know, it really does help to have that community. And like I said, I just want to thank you all for being a part of it. And, you know, we when we reopen the door to talk about our traumas and talk about situations that weren't the healthiest for us, you know, it's important to just acknowledge that and, you know, just recognize uh, the triggers that come with it. You know, when I talk about boot camp, you know, I'll be honest, the first thing I smell is um, uh, Irish Spring. Anytime anybody ever says Irish Spring or an Irish or boot camp, like I just think Irish Spring soap, that's all I can smell. Like it's just an immediate trigger. But, um, you know, I'll just, I'll leave it right there for now. And uh, th just thank you for letting me share. May I caveat off of what Montgomery shared? Thank you so very kindly, my brother, man, because something that really jumped out to me as we were speaking about uh, being selfless Something that, that really jumped out to me is about, which I want to say is the importance of us as veterans and being gracious with and for ourselves to lean back into ourselves. As what Montgomery was saying, he really leaned back into his culture, which is a beautiful culture. Myself as a black man, when I came back, I really am still leaning into 
being black all day, every day, black, 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 lean into it. And as I mentioned a little earlier, I had commented on taking the time to find yourself while still utilizing what we learned from the military to really take a step back and to put into action selfless service, everything that we were indoctrinated with. And I can say when we switch that perspective, that in itself empowers us all over again. So the offer is, is to really lean into who you are along with what the military has graced us with. Because for all of it, for all of it, I would not go back in time and say, I will not do this to myself because I'm a far better human being, a far better, I'm a super civilian because of what I now know. It's because of this experience that truly allows myself along with all of us on this panel to really stand in our power and again, lead from the front because of the selfless service, of the honor of the duty, of everything that we literally signed our names contractually, we are the walking embodiments of the Constitution. So to think about that should really empower us to say that it's okay to come and still be, whether we are, and some of us are broken, some of us are, are maimed, some of us are suffering in silence, some of us are homeless, some of us are unalive ourselves, but it's important that we have to find the strength in ourselves to be able to see what we need, to be able to look at our brother, to fall back on the battle buddy system that we were trained in. Look for your veterans, look for the rest of us, look for the people on this panel. But I said, Fred, look into yourself first, because you're not as broken as they would have you believe. You're far more powerful and far more aware and far more capable. And so this is what I can say. I'm excited about this panel too, because we are all capable and what it is that we have gone through, that we're standing here in this aftermath to show how capable we are to move forward and to truly change and redirect whatever ailments we may have. And as we mentioned a couple of times, arts, like you should find your voice in, in poetry and painting and playing with Play-Doh and knitting. There's meditation in that. There's healing in that type of meditation for self to find yourself, to heal yourself. Ooh, yeah. Can I say one yeah. thing? Yeah, Sandra, please. As I've been listening, um, I started really rereading the wholeness for humanity as it defines me. And that was something I always said that I maintained it. But my humanity was for the fact that I could still be empathetic. Mm -hmm. I still had compassion because when I first came in, it was a matter of kill or be killed. And I learned how to, de uh, to, uh, de to decompress everything. And everything was in its own box that my went through security clearance to where my parents did not even show up. Because I was taught, don't show that vulnerability that someone can use your family member against you. So I always hid those things. And I remember when I tried to do a break in service, I had made a mistake and got a 96 on the exam. But because I didn't accept errors, I literally came back on active duty in order to do it. Because all I saw was black and white. It was either right or it was wrong. I did not do gray. And as I'm now retiring, I'm learning to do the gray. And it's scary and it's frightening, but I'm grateful that I have been able to maintain my compassion and my empathy. And that I, although I know there are known enemies, I try not to view people as an enemy. And I try to maintain that respect. And so, for me, the, the get my humanity is that I can still be empathetic, I can be compassionate, and although I was so used to putting everybody else's needs first, I'm now learning boundaries of how to take care of myself in addition to also trying to help others. Boundaries. 
So that's humanity for me is the fact that I can still see something that's terrible and it does generate a tear or that I can feel compassion for someone who's had a loss versus feeling dead inside and have no heart. Mm -hmm. I'm done. No more. Nothing else. Thank you so much for all that. Um, any other thoughts as we as we look towards um, moving into Q and A with the audience? Uh, and, uh, yeah, yeah, Tim. If I could uh, comment, please, if you wouldn't mind. Sure, please. Uh, to, my, to Montgomery's point, you said Irish Spring. For me, it was lima beans during basic training. I was forced to eat them at the child hall at basic training. I hated them thirty eight years ago, and I still hate them today. Um, and one of the things that I wanted to say, and I think uh, Melanie can attest to that. I'm a proud U.S. Army veteran. I like to tell people that if you cut me, I bleed green, Army green. On the weekends, I wear a lot of U.S. Army fatigues. And what I'm about to say might offend some folks, and I hope I don't. I wear it, I wear it because I live, I reside in Suffolk County, New York, rather conservative, somewhat racist. So as a member of, his, of the Hispanic community in Patchogue, New York, you know, first impressions are, this individual is probably undocumented, probably doesn't speak English, and probably is here to take someone's job. So as a way of protecting myself, I wear US Army regalia almost every weekend. And I have people tell me, thank you for your service. And my response is, thank you for the recognition. But I do it as a form of protection because if I weren't, wasn't wearing Army gear, right? I would probably be looked at as an undocumented individual who doesn't deserve to live in the United States and take advantage of all the rights and entitlements of a, of a U.S., uh, of an American, right? So I wear the uniform as a, as a form of protection, right? And what I mean when I wear that uniform is that you don't have to respect me. I don't care what you think about me. But how about respecting the fact that I wore this country's uniform in the United States Army for 11 years, and I did so proudly. Thank you. That's all I have to say. Thank you so much for that. So, any other thoughts from the panel? There's a. I know there's a lot. Probably, you know, it's a, a lot's coming up in this conversation, and um, you know, it is for me too. And and you know, as I've said before, and quickly, just my own response is that becoming a social worker and activist and organizer is what saved my life after I got out of the army and, you know, purp meaningful purpose and serving others, but also serving in a very different way that is, that contradicts my service in the military, that counters my mil 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 service in the military. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, and it's interesting. Yeah. My, that, that oath, it's not, you know, for me, the, that the oath, there's, there's a principle there. Um, and, you know, I don't, I and mean, we, we can all vary. I, I have no allegiances. I, I'm not a patriotic person. You know, my, my commitments are to human beings and, and do, playing a role in alleviating human suffering. And so, you know, that's, so, you know, and I think a lot of us, you know, can come out very ambivalent even about that. You know, am I still patriotic? Am I not? Do I still, do I still feel honor my oath to the U S constitution or the, the U S as a nation state, but it's, but I loved being in the, I loved being in the army when I was doing it, <laughs> you know? So it's, yeah. So it gets complicated. Mm -hmm. um, Melanie, are you there? I am here, sir. <laughs> can, what's, can you, what's up, Tim? can you assist with, with this part about uh, Q and A with, uh, or the chat? Yes. Yes. How, um, how can I assist you? Well, let's let's go going through. I guess being fair, you're probably pretty good at this by now. Um, j just so that we can, you know, start ask, you know, asking some of the, the panelists some of the questions coming up. Sure. If and yeah, to the um participant, to people listening, please put your questions in the Q and A because we'll we'll go through them. Um, and participants, if you feel called to, if you have the ability, feel free to click. The Q and A and answer the open or the answered questions. You can answer 
in the things that are already answered, you can click type answer and add to that. And since the after action survey and the supplemental materials won't be going out until the end of this month, I will have time to take a lot of these answers and add them to the supplemental material. Um, but yeah, Tim, some great questions. And we have a whole nother 50 minutes on this panel. Very exciting because this has been one of the most intense panels of the day. It's fantastic. Um, it's catch our breath and dig in, huh? Yeah, yeah. Take a breath. You guys have been um, sharing some very intimate, very uplifting and very difficult things all, all in a very uh, short time frame. Um, so, OK, so this is actually a great question. Um, Therese and uh, Seward both um, have some questions about spirituality. Um, can you guys maybe go through and talk about how, I, I know Becton and Montgomery have, have kind of touched on it, um, uh, Abdul too, can you guys go through and talk about how spirituality has played a central support in your, li in your life or um, helped your sense of self? Um, I, I, can, I can start with that, if that's okay. Um, so I can talk about a little bit about basic training, the experience of others, and then I can talk also, and I'll talk a little bit about when I was um, in, you know, later on AIT and stuff. Um, so in basic training, going in, I kind of felt um, the need to kind of like hide my identity or spirituality or whatever it is. And like, you know, because I was just going in, I didn't know anything about what other people believe or think, whatever it is. I didn't know what type of racism I'm going to counter um, or encounter, sorry. So I, I, I had to kind of very much hide that and just, you know, go with the flow pray in silence sometimes at certain moments, whatever it is. And it was super important for me because it was, you know, it was just an anchor to, um, you know, just reaching out to a higher, uh, you know, to a higher uh, being, let's say, or, you know, d d you know, depends on faith, whatever. It's, it's just that, you know, I had to go back to what, you know, keeps me centered, let's say in, in that way. And um, so every set, every Saturday or Sunday, um, I'm sorry, every Sunday during basic training, that's when they would allow people to go, you know, to a church, whatever it is. A lot of us didn't want to stay stuck um, at our barracks or whatever it is, just because we don't want to be stuck cleaning for everybody else. Because everybody is, you know, they're going to the services, whatever it is. So I had to, so I tagged along almost with every person that I know that would go to church, just, you know, as a battle buddy. So that way I can, you know, be within that um, you know, I would take it as my pastime, but at the same time, also they're, they, they need, sometimes they need somebody to go with them because if nobody went with them or nobody volunteered, they're not going to go. You can't go on your own. You have to have somebody go with you. So I mean, as a Muslim, I, I, I led a, uh, Buddhist service. I went to Wiccan service more than once. I went to, um, uh, different Christian denominations. And we'd always, we'd kind of like hop every week just to find like which Christian denomination the, you know, the, uh, the pastor is going to bring food because you know we're sick of uh, basic training food so we'd go there and like oh like they have mac and cheese today let's let's make a note or whatever and you know tell the other battle buddies like for next week but it's just it was very amazing because when i go with those people to their communities or what they feel and you can kind of see that there's the energy is different you know they, it's just they just want to they just, they just want to discard what they've went through through last week or two weeks of basic training and all that you know the drill sergeant stuff and all that kind of stuff and they're just like you can see that communal energy and um, it was, it was for me, like, it was humbling, you know, because you can see you people every, you know, find those little windows of escape for them, because that's what they self identify with. And that was their little windows of just remembering who they are before they go back to being just told, you know, mission first. Um, sadly, I didn't have a place to go. So I would go with them. Um, but during uh, later, I, I had a chance when I was in, uh, in my unit for Bragg, uh, I was part of the 82nd and 82nd are very, uh, they, they consider themselves very high speed and they're all about drinking the Kool-Aid and all, and, you know, jumping out of planes, whatever it is. Ramadan happened. And I was blessed enough that at the time, you know, people were starting to get a little bit more aware about the need of religious freedom or something, you know, but it's also, it, you know, you'll get, you'll, you'll get a, 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 from command, you'll get a paper, like, you know, let Muslim um, soldiers or, or service members or personnel, you know, be able to fast or whatever it is and just try to accommodate them. But then also that depends on your direct uh, chain of command because it's, you know, behind closed doors, you know, they can sometimes like, no, no, we have a training. We can't do that. We can't, whatever it is, you're like mission essential to this or whatnot. But I had an opportunity during Ramadan that month to go to the mosque and meet 
um, you know, the, the Muslim chaplain who was a sergeant major, uh, a retired sergeant major from 82nd. So it was very, for me, it was amazing because I finally was able to talk to somebody who kind of, you know, who understood me on a faith basis, but at the same time, he had, he knew what it was to also be a soldier and also to live through that duality. And also he had it through like a, even a harder time when, it, you know, these things were not as allowed as they were during my time. And, you know, and we talk and sometimes you'd sit down and you would hear, you know, you might hear stories or, you know, laughs about like, you know, certain experiences that they went through and all that kind of stuff and where, where things are now. So it's, it's, it's spiritual, but at the same time, I think communal to a certain point. And it all comes back with, you know, that, that kind of calibration. Uh, uh, and, and yeah, and also I agree with Montgomery, like, you know, it's, 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 it's that kind of thing of, you know, you're, you're giving out energy and uh, being able to do it at peace and also being able to do it in, in, in a positive manner is just, you know, it just, I think I, it helped you, it helped me a lot of times just kind of like, I know, you know, I know this moment is rough right now. I know it's terrible. I know it's whatever it is, but there's something else right now. And I got to keep on holding on to it because believe me, you know, it's some people like I, I, you know, fortunately I didn't go through like much rough experiences that other people went through, but when you see friends or when you hear of stories that people went through that, whatever it is, you'd imagine that if you were in that situation and that experience happened to you, you know, you'd want that, you, you'd you want to be holding on to something that strong to remind you that this is all, you know, th this, this will pass and, ho or, or hopefully it will pass. Right. So, yeah. So I'm sorry. I talked a little bit too long, but yeah, that's, that's my response. Great stuff. Thank you. Can I go? Yeah. Yeah, please. Okay. Mine was unique. And I chose to leave it out. I was at Fort Jackson. I was born and raised an Orthodox Jew. So when I got to Fort Jackson, I got there just in the height of high holy days. And believe it or not, Fort Jackson literally gave me the governor, the general's car. And they drove me to synagogue every Friday night. I caught heck from the drill sergeants, but they made sure that I was available for services. When I was in Korea, we had like a 500 person Seder because the Lubavitch were there. So I had a good experience. But when I came back to Fort Knox, um, I came back in the height of Passover and they did not want to make arrangements for my meals. So they transferred me from a field unit to the hospital. And as time progressed on, when I came back from high holidays, when I made a statement that they wanted me to do it, I actually got busted by two ranks. And the Sergeant Major told me that he felt I was somebody who was lazy and wanted to be a malingerer and that I had just picked a religion that would give me the most time off. So there were some battles in there. And ironically, because I was a good person, both the Anti-Deformation League and the NWCP came out because of, hey, I was a polarization thing that they did. It Those people got relieved. And then I was on a spiritual journey when I went to Afghanistan. I was in Iraq and Afghanistan and Mogadishu, but when I got to Afghanistan, I actually got to meet the last Jew that lived in Afghanistan because a rabbi came in from Israel to give the guy a get because his wife wanted to get married. And But I had such a spiritual um, thing that I think that that tour in Afghanistan, based on how I believe and everything, made me to be a better person. So the spirituality is very strong and important to me. And um, it got me through a lot of times when I was getting discouraged and it put people around me that I believe that also helped keep me safe to where I came back with all my fingers and all my toes. Um. Thank you, Sandra. There was another question that maybe, Tim, you could even answer yourself since you're also a veteran. All the veterans could answer. Um, some of the uh, audience was a little surprised when the panel started about how tough and difficult, um, you know, discriminatory or just overall unpleasant the training conditions, the conditions in general of military service were. Um, I think for veterans, it might have come across very uh very gentle, the examples, but um, some of them are asking, has it always been this way? Was it this way up until 
you got out and what are things that could be done to support? So like I mentioned some civilian oversight boards, congressional inquiry, stuff like that. But if you could give a little bit of your experience of if you see the culture changing and what you think could be done to improve the culture, that's a reoccurring question I'm seeing. So I'm, I'm, there's there's multiple questions there there right um, there's and, and, and good ones too it's um, about changing the culture and was it always was it always hard you know and and, and I'm hearing that as based upon well the the initial indoctrination is is you know going through basic training and AIT and such um, and then ongoing depending on if you're deploy, deployed or not but. Um, it was, and, and I think it varies too, based on MOS, right? Our jobs too, it can vary. And so, but then the, this last, this other piece, the, so there's that, what I, what I heard with, within part of that first part of that question, the second part, what I'm hearing is, um, is there things that can be, is it, is it still rough like that? And there, are there things that can change or how can it change? Which <laughs> I have lots of thoughts about that, but I want to just kind of let the, the panel pipe in here with what you think. I so, like to go. I like to go first. One of our biggest problem is that was it hard going through? Yes, but I think it made me a better person. But it's changed with them starting doing the stress cards and all this other stuff. But the other problem is, is that when they started having a need to try to get people recruited, they instituted moral waivers. So a lot of people that would have normally have been turned away are now in there. So to me, I think it po it poisoned the lines a little bit. Mm -hmm. And so, and the fact that we do a disservice to our children as a whole, that a lot of them don't know, no. So no matter how much we think we're trying to soften up the military, because some of these individuals have not been trained to develop their own interpersonal trying to join the military, I think will always be difficult for them if they have not learned to take the initiative. Yeah. Um, and that's and that's just it. But the quality and the characters of some of the people we've let in, like we've noticed that there's been a lot of more sexual assaults going into the, uh, the training by NCOs or then, and that's because I don't think we're screening enough about the integrity and the quality of the people that we are bringing in as well as another problem. Yeah, and, and Sandra, and Pete, well, all of that, and and piece of that too, is that because of, and again, this authoritarian command structures, right, that, that we're in, there's, there's a lot of room for uh, arbitrary decision-making and arbitrary targeting. Absolutely. People. Um, you know, that's, that's very personal. It can be very personal in nature, but it's also, you know, there could be very little accountability of people being, being targeted for, again, that, that based on, on, on um, you know, racism, um, cer certainly, you know, one's gender and sexuality and, and, and such, but, but also just, you know, there's room just like, you know, I don't really like, like that guy. So I'm going to dog him yeah. out. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's a lot of bullying that they hide behind the aspect, oh, I'm mentoring. It's like, you're not mentoring. You're bullying a person trying to break them down and make them feel less than. Yeah, abuse. Abuse is pretty, is, there's a lot of room for abuse built in, right? So, yeah. Yes. Anyone else want to speak to this? A lot of good upcoming questions for after. Uh, Becton, go ahead. But a lot of really great questions in the chat for after. I could say that so much of that abuse was so imperative in our basic training. I mean, they even said to us, I was, like I said, I was the oldest in my incoming company. And so I had to have drill sergeants tell me, well, this is how we're doing, or, you know, this, that, and the other. But it really was a part of them breaking us down to zero so that we can be built up into the super soldiers that we are, still are. We just really have to tap back into it to remember who and what we are. Thank you, Becton. Um, I, wow, this is a great one. This is a really, uh, Charles Mont Montante asked this, and I think this is a really um, super philosophical, but also very intimate question. 
Um, it, he asks, is it possible to have a military that is caring and humanistic when a central part of the purpose is to kill or be killed? And I hope someone talks about um, aid and mutual, like mutual aid and humanitarian work. But I know the other answers are going to be really intense. So, um, yeah. So, can the military be compassionate, or can there be space for compassion when you know so often the idea of the military is boiled down to that act of? Care? Can I add? Can I add addition to that? Is a mil a military that is that that is serves the interests of neocolonialism and imperialism? by design. Charles wins the question award for today. Yeah. So I just want to throw that piece in there, right? As we're, as we're thinking about this. Actually, I say yes. And I use that, I say yes, because of both in Mogadishu and in Afghanistan, um, I did preventive medicine. And I traveled with a set that we brought veterinary corps we actually worked with them for the maternal and infant onset, uh, aspect of it and also vaccinating their animals. And because we were also trying to get the people to trust the Afghan army and the police, we had communities that were do donating clothing and stuff for us to give to the nationals that we turned over to the police department. And they were the ones that did the big band thing of taking care of the individuals. You know, we have our special forces, so they can be a lot more the kicking in the doors. But we did have other aspects that did show a certain amount of compassion of seeing that these people have been victimized and they're a victim of their circumstance. They're not the enemy. And if we can embrace them and give them hope, then maybe they will not then get sucked up into the chaos and then become a future enemy. So we did a lot of counterinsurgency. And with that, it did give us a little bit of room for compassion and humanitarian assist. Um, I think this answer is kind of much more complicated. Uh, like not the, the question is a little bit complicated because I mean, theoretically, yes, you can have a military that is, you know, caring and humanistic. But the problem is that the mission, you know, the mission that this military is given and also, you know, because I know we talk about the military and that kind of stuff, but the military is another arm for politics, you know, and um, and, you know, I'm, I don't want to go delve into whatever, you know, politics and whatever it is, but in a certain way the military as it is now is probably much more humanistic than lots of other militaries around the world. And yes, there's, you know, and remember like, you know, humanity itself, you, you there is really no utopian country that you can look at and say that there is not things that are going and being hidden whatever it is, you know, it's, you know, there's the nature of humanity when it comes to it as well. But at, I mean, when it comes to this kill and be killed and whatever it is, yes, you do want to have hardened, you know, warriors, hardened fighters, you know, and um, people that are, you know, when it comes, you know, when push comes to shove, they're, they can function under pressure and, you know, do that. Uh -huh. But, sorry, um, somebody want to jump in or, oh, um, but I think. Yeah, it's it's also the the mission itself. Also, where are we? You know, is is it a foreign intervention? Is it is it self defense that that's 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 going on? Or like you know, and um, so I think those all you have to you know have to include them when you think about you know humanistic, and and also uh, perceiving, uh, you know, perceiving other lives also because then you're going to have to like, are we looking at American lives or you know, are we looking at you know other countries? lives and then that becomes there there are also you're going to have dehumanization dehumanization because i mean it's 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 a blessing and at the same time yes you're going to have you know it's that the, the 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 fabric of the united states when it comes to reality it's like it's so diverse and you have all these you know all these groups and minorities that are part of it and that's the reality of it and then that also can be reflected within the army itself that you're going to find the, all these minorities and i mean and, and here you have the panel like these we're all examples of that that you know and you know not we're, we're not we're not all green but then also when you think like what does we're not all green mean it, it means also we're not all also that image 
that physical image of the soldier in your or, or like service member that's in your mind that there are other you know like i'm brown for example right and um so when it comes to that i think humanistic also is going to be very different compared to what you know your background is or whatever it is because for me you know what the, like be more caring and more humanistic means like when i go into this territory or this country or whatever it is i really need to be very culturally savvy and mm -hmm. educated and and at the same time when the people put the targets and the mission whatever it is they really need to know what we're going into and how we have to deal with this culture and this all kind of stuff we can't just be also very you know black or white when it comes to how we're going to deal with every crisis that's going on around the world because there's so so much more factors um so yeah so i guess regarding that i think it's is it possible you know maybe but i think it's going to depend on the situation always and that's not something and a lot of times it's not up to the military to decide that because you know you're going to have you know politics play and in, in, in take part you know what i find so fascinating about that thank you abdul for that response um and for the question as a whole because my perspective is is the military is a microcosm of these united states of america and we are living in some of the most tumultuous asinine backhanded reality ever so i think in order to want to change something like the military we have to first change these united states of america and how it's governed how it's run how there are individuals who are responsible for steering this country in a direction who have never served as a matter of fact sit up here and say that we're the jackasses for joining in the first place you know we know so much but we're being burdened by you know so many external influences this nation is racist this nation is a racist white supremacist country and it's purely built on the philosophy of capitalism so when you think about those two aspects those two aspects are literally embedded in every aspect of our living lives including the military so when you think about how they're recruiting us, they're not recruiting us for our intellect, logic, and reason. They're recruiting us as bodies, as green body bags to go and do something that someone else said go and do. So when you think about how that can change, it really has to change with us when we decide to sign up or not, or decide not to, to really hold on to that. Say, well, I'm not going to serve until you do this, that, or the other. Like we are citizens of these United States of America and it's our responsibility to take that power back. Because right now we seem like a bunch of complicit, complacent sucker ass suckers as these people are running us into the ground. And why I'm so happy to be on this panel today to speak to veterans because it, it, if anybody can really pick up these reins to wrestle these reins away, it is us. We, being the embodiments of the Declaration of Independence, being the embodiment of the Constitution, it is us, we, the veterans. We may be broken, battered, and less than, but we are still built to lead from the front. We can change this if we want to. If we want to. Yeah. Back then, as you're saying that, I, I, you know, it's, it's very reflective of, of, of course, behind you. Uh, you, you've got James Baldwin and Stokely Carmichael and others, but, those, people, right? but, but you're channeling th those those two figures, you know, that uh, in in what you're saying. And so I just I just want to acknowledge that, and it's a beautiful thing. Um, Thank you, brother. I mean, this is why we're here in this panel today to help us mentally, psychologically, physically to see the world for what it is and step up. We have to step up because these people aren't doing it for us. We are living through <laughs> through a fascist regime. I went in, in, to the military to find out what type of man I was, to test my mettle, and that damn right I did find out. And I came out stronger on the other side, still broken and battered, but I'm not disintegrated. I can still stand in the power to represent because that's what we have to do that's just my opinion. We have to do this. We are trained to. We have the mental capacity to. We just have to come together and make it happen. And, and, and that's thank. You, thanks again. And so, yeah, the the interests. It, it, the military d does the bidding of interests that are not about defending 
us. It's not about protecting <laughs> people and citizens or the majority of them. Of course, uh, you know, those who hold a lot of power, economic and political power, those who make decisions protect to protect their interests, which are at odds with most people in this country. Um, and including those of us who serve and do do the killing and dying. Um, there was no, you know, we just over history. That my my father was a Vietnam vet. He was in the infantry, and he, you know, the, what the the harm that came to him and everyone, and, and there's you know that story is told over and over again, is that that was an imperialist war. There was no reason the Viet Vietnamese were trying to get to to decolonize after France, and then the U.S. came in as a neo-colonial power based upon strategic interests to uh, for an, as as an empire as as a growing global empire and so we 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 have a military of empire and main, maintaining empire we have 800 military outposts around the world that's an empire and all the other countries combined don't even equal that that amount so and it's reflective of everything the lies that were told to invade Iraq. That's well known now, right? And how many how many Iraqis died and continue to suffer because of that? And of course, our own military personnel who are largely working working class people, right? Poor working class people. And then and then and, and again, it's a reflective right now what's going on. The, this empire is is protecting and funding genocide in Gaza. And you know, I mean, we got to name this stuff too as veterans. I I believe. Um, can I be Tim? Can I be a little bit self indulgent and um, make a comment and then lead into the next question? Please do, Melanie. Oh. <laughs> okay, so um, as you guys were talking and in relation to that question, I'm writing a veterans advocacy book, and I had to like wrestle with this question, and I kind of came up with this like sentence or two sentences that kind of I hope encapsulates it is that as service members we can be part of a system that empowers and abuses us right as well as that greater system turning around to externally empower and abuse others right so that stuff is all happening in tandem and i just want to like again reiterate that that like some veterans have terrible experiences some veterans have great experiences but in general the service will empower some veterans and absolutely be detrimental to others while at the same time institutionally externally going forth in the world and empowering some places like you know afghanistan for 20 years we like girls were able to get educations and read that is meaningful just because the Taliban like rules them now does not mean that that 20 years of education is wasted on those women. That's that's an amazing thing we did. But at the same time, we're the same military that cleared off the the, the native indigenous inhabitants of the island of Diego Garcia because we, we liked that little land strip for us for geopolitical reasons. Right. We have to reconcile with that and hold that in balance. Um, so. That leads into the last question, right? We all have been, you know, have this bittersweet experience with military. We've been elevated by it and struggled by it. This question is uh, quite a doozy, but would you in 2024, the year of our Lord 2024, would you recommend that a young person potentially enlist, right? It's such a loaded question. And, well, um, can, I, can I add yeah. to this real quick too? Because yeah. <laughs> this is, I, I, I teach, you know, as a professor of social work, I teach a military social work class. And it's, um, and, and that came up with just, you know, with, with myself and a panel of veterans in one class. And the, the student came, a student asked that question, but all is like, would you encourage uh, youth today to join the military? And would you allow for your children to join the military? So there's, there's two pieces to this, right? Yeah, no, I I know for okay. I want to answer that question. I'm not yeah. even on this panel, and I really want to. Well, let, we'll get it. Let's come back to you on that. Um, let's let's open up to the panel too. It's funny that someone did that because I actually experienced that where um, there were some young people. One wanted to join the Marines, and another parent was trying to force their child to join the military. 
the one that wanted to join the Marines, I encouraged him. The other one, I did not. And the mother wanted to know why I did that. And I said, because of your son's personality. I said, if he does not want to do this, he is an analytical thinker. He likes to ask questions. He likes to challenge anything that is said to him. I said, and because of that, that is not conducive for him to join the military because he will run the risk of potentially getting a dishonorable discharge, which is like being a convicted felon without doing the crime. Okay. And that's the whole thing. If you have someone that, if I see someone who really is wholeheartedly wants to be that soldier or that Marine or whatever, I will encourage them, but give them guidance as to what is all entailed in that and let them know that when you take that oath, there is a reply, there is an implied unspoken that you will give your life for this country. You cannot pick the day and time that it will happen. But if you serve, there's a strong possibility that you will die. And if you're willing to accept that potential risk and that's what you want to do, more power to you. But when I see children that are book smart and they like to challenge authority, I direct them from them to measure their heart and determine if they think that is something that they would like to do and can do it wholeheartedly by taking orders even when they think it's stupid and that's the problem if you got someone that can do that and willing to swallow their pride to participate then i'm all for it but i also knew how anal retentive that mother was and the field that she wanted to go it's almost guaranteed he would get through boot camp then his happy ass would be in a combat zone mm -hmm. and if he died then i got this family member bitching at me oh you encouraged my son and now he's dead i don't want that responsibility so I give it to them that way for them to determine. So, yes, I do discern that and I try to guide them if that's what they really want to do. I'll support them. But if someone's trying to make someone do it and they're not sure and I know their character, I will discourage them. Thank you, Sandra. Yeah. Um... Sorry, I'm, I'm going to give two answers. One, what my wife just told me right now on the screen, she said, depends on the personality and also, you know, give them the pros and cons before. Uh, my answer is going to be, I, um, I, I, it's going to be, you know, it's, I, I'm, it's going to be way, like, I'm going to have to be very careful um, because, you know, it's, it's by giving input, I'm also kind of responsible for that person's outcome, um, you know, and, and, and what might happen. But one thing about it is that, yes, there's the attraction of, you know, somewhat financial st stability, somewhat there is that kind of growth. Sometimes, you know, if, if, if a certain person, you know, kind of needs to learn, of course, there are other ways to doing that, right? But also it depends on the situation because I remember during basic training, you know, you'll see these 17, 18 year olds who have come like, you know, from broken homes and, and uh, no families and stuff like that. And you can see the transformation within 10 weeks, kind of like at least the, impl the implementation of structure, what it did to them. And then at the same time, you can see a lot of other people that that 10 weeks, for example, really, if anything, did the complete opposite and maybe like, you know, or, or has, hasn't done any change to them at all. Um, the thing about the military is that it's 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 a commitment. It's it's you know depending what is it three years at the least or you know five years depending on if you're active duty right now. We're not talking about reserve and that kind of stuff where you can still be in touch with the civilian life and all that kind of stuff. And at the same time, also you know uh, you you continue your service. But I think my biggest thing with the military is that we if we really do care about Americans and 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 the youth is that instead of you know, certain achievements, like, yes, we'll give you a $200 bonus, or we'll give you, you know, if you do this scale or whatever you acquire, we'll, you know, we'll add $300 to your paycheck or $100, whatever it is. We should really start focusing on education within the military to be a in financial incentive. And, and, and that way, when those youth go in 18, 19, and they leave at 22, 23, and then they try to find their place in the world after that, they actually have something that can help them, you know, stand ground 
with other people who haven't joined. And, and those four or five years, they had a completely different life. But at the same time, when they apply for jobs and that kind of stuff, it's not just only you're a veteran, but at the same time, also, I am qualified to do the job and also succeed in achieving it. Because I feel education also will give you a certain type of growth. In, and I'm not saying that's the only way to succeed and stuff like that, but I'm saying right now, putting you in, in, in you know, to, to, to study and to learn about other things and also to give you more options in life will help that person also you know, will also enhance their self-belief and see their potential um, in, in a certain way. So if, if so regarding a young person wanting to go into that, I think the, all these things have to be factored in to like be able to really give my, you know, uh, approval. I would say that it's about being uh, communicating. Like I've had individuals ask me if they should, and I've always told them to know what you're getting into do your research because each branch of service is different and requires different. And I say to really understand what it is that you're going in for. Why are you doing it? And I would say, yes, there's a part of me that even thinks that a great many of us should go through that process. You can be a pacifist and still learn about what it is because to this day, I still hold on to those core values. I mean, I'm still living by my loyalty, by my duty, by my respect, selfless service, by my honor, by my integrity, by my personal courage. I learned those things because I volunteered to come in. That's why I said, you know, I'm up I'm, for us as a society to all, and I'm, I'm considering the mandatory service and that the Koreans have to go through, that the, the Israelis have to go through, you come out on the other side with a shorthand of understanding of yourself, your brother, your community, your neighborhood, your country. And when you can come and stand on those two feet and the perspective changes, you know, you, you have a, a, a new accessibility to yourself that can offer you a direction in life. So I would say, yes, look into it, know why you're going into it, study, be truthful, and then be ready to relinquish all sense of self and control and go along for the ride. Cause that's exactly what you're doing. You're no longer that individual that everybody knew in high school, you are green. And then when you come out, you have to figure out how green you are still as a civilian and how it's left a mark on you. That is the benefit I say of going through because you learn who you are. Hmm. Yeah. yeah, I think it's kind of important to include that just where, I don't know, I guess that societies everywhere across the world, you know, there's so much of a connection to information out there. So I feel like in a sense, this might be the most woke period of humanity. So a lot of uh, young people, they already have a sense of what the, what the military is, especially coming from the United States component. So I think for me advising somebody, obviously I a hundred percent agree with everybody's perspective on know what you're getting into, have an idea of what you're trying to accomplish and even then, most of the goals that you set when you go in, they're ultimately not, may or may not happen at the end. It's going to be uh, an experience that's going to change you in a lot of different ways. But it's it's tough. Just it's it, it's really hard just to gauge, um, you know, the the uh, the willingness to serve, especially nowadays when they're lowering ASVAB scores to just damn near the basement don't you know? even have to graduate high school now anymore. yeah you there's a recruiting it, crisis yep. mm -hmm. there, there's a recruitment crisis right now so it's really hard to to want to encourage someone to join i guess coming from that situation it's just like well hey look you know x amount of dollars for going in for x amount of time and these are the benefits and so on and so forth when you know a lot of people you know there's a lot of uprising and a lot of that kind of comes from these communities where a lot of the recruitment comes from, essentially. You know, you get uh, BIPOC people that come from areas that suffer from poverty, you know, among other, you know, um, detrimental effects to their life. But in those areas, that's where a lot of the uprising is like happening. So I, I for me personally, it, you know, I 100% agree with what everyone's saying, but it, it's even tougher to encourage somebody to to participate um as 
you know, Mel or Melanie said, um, it's like a double-edged sword, you know, we all got the personal benefits out of it. We all got the, the character growth and it helped us grow profoundly in areas that other, we may or may not have otherwise achieved uh, in a civilian capacity, but I, it, it's hard for me to, to tell indigenous youth to join just because of the morals and the values that I'm perpetuating with the imperialism that my people have historically suffered. And it even gets more so back for me personally. Uh, you know, when I got out um, and I started being around cultural leaders and around our warrior societies where I actually had to redact that oath and I had to swear back an oath to my people. So even though I am a citizen of the United States, you know, I'm still a citizen of my tribe. And that is first and foremost for me. So tough to advocate, but 100% on board with there's a, so many benefits to it. But, you know, it's a fine line to walk. And, uh, you know, free education will only take you so far if you're living with the traumas and everything that uh, <laughs> that you've been through. So, you know, it's it is what it is. And, uh, you know, I think I'll put it this way. If I had to go back and convince myself to join, um, I would tell myself, you know, think five years ahead, think four years ahead. You know, this is the amount of time that you're committing in your contract. Think that far and imagine how, how different your life can be and what you want for yourself. And, you know, obviously, as a younger individual, you know, we don't think any further than the next, the young, upcoming weekend for most of us. But I think that would be the advice that I give myself is like, where do you see yourself in four or five years and committing X amount of time, X amount of your life? And what exactly does this mean to you? Right. And yeah, my response to that would be it's more or less just a tradition and a heritage. So uh, I'll, I'll leave it right there with that for now. Thank you. Yeah, it's, it's tough. I mean, quickly, I went in my 17, right, and be, was became a, a highly trained killer. And my job was to kill people as, you know, as a recon scout. And that that took its toll on me. And I, I don't I don't want other people going through that. It, it would depend on the mission. But no, I, I would not want my kids to join the military. I would not. I I would want them to to stay here and affect change, need a change in this country domestically. And to focus that on in their lives, um, and or if they pass eighteen, they 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 made the decision. I would say, you know, at least go in the Air Force or Space Force. All right, exact them all. <laughs> exact them all. I consider if I had gone into the Air Force instead of the Army, I could still be in. Yeah, Melanie, do you wanted to just pipe in on this question. Well, Sorry. I, you know, I agree with, I've never felt so much, I'm not even on this panel and I've never felt so much solidarity as like a Latina woman, just feeling the, the community. Cause these are, these are conversations that when I have worked in, um, uh, just certain spaces, they're not welcome conversations. It's, you know, and again, these are not the definitive answer. These are not the end note, but this, the, the discourse, right. Having this discourse just as food for thought is not welcome in all spaces. So I do feel a lot of solidarity. Um, I joined because, you know, someone asked once, well, why would you join for all of these reasons? And my response was I'm poor. Like I grew up poor. My mom was a single mom. I have three siblings. All of us joined the military, every single one of us. Um, and if I was smarter, I would have joined the air, <laughs> but I am a Marine. So well, you have to you, you you have to be smart. Instead, you you chose to eat crayons. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it, you know, they're they're very tasty. Um, but you know, so just like everyone else, I wouldn't tell anyone to do anything as far as join or not join. I'd be honest. The military, it's Becton was so right. It's flipping a coin. It can you know, my house, my husband and I. I'm 30 years old. My husband and I were able to afford a house in this economy because we both served. We had the VA home loan. The benefits are literally the best thing even with them changing their retirement stuff the benefits are the best thing you'll get if you get out with an honorable discharge they are the best thing you can get in the whole world given the end stage capitalism we are in like this house i have taken in homeless friends i have had a, a garden to 
practice growing plants with my mother. I have like to Montgomery's point about like culture and family. I have been able to plant things in my garden that come from my, my mom and my grandmother's home. Right. Like I, everything good in my life at this point in my life, all of the authority, all the things I've learned has come from the military, but so has some of the most upsetting dehumanizing traumas. Right. So it's how much are you willing to suffer to create a better future. Some people don't survive that process. We have a lot of brothers and sisters that don't make it, right? Mm -hmm. We have a lot of people that take their own lives because the pressure becomes too much. Every, I would cry myself to sleep in the service thinking like, just what, just what Montgomery said, five years from now, I'm going to be able to provide for my family, right? And that was my guiding star. And I am proud to have served, but it's nuanced, right? So I would say when asking people if they want to join, how much are they willing to suffer for the, what they want? Because it is it is suffering. It is like Absolutely. how much you can hold space for constant discomfort, right? And still see the end result. It was like the most beautiful and difficult time of my life. It was the, I served with my husband, who's also a Marine. It was the uh, hardest part of our marriage. Most mm -hmm. difficult. We like, if there was going to be a time, it would have been then. Mm -hmm. um, but any, okay. So I just want to say like, agree with them. It, it is just such um I wouldn't stop people. It's the ticket to a better life, but it comes with so much baggage and people don't know. That's that's all. Um, but Scott, if you want to do your closing yeah, remarks, close us out. Uh, well, there's there's no closing words. I, I'm not going to say any more than <laughs> all the powerful and really meaningful stuff that's been said. And I just want, I, I guess, just say I'm, I really appreciate this panel and thank you for participating. Um, and... Yeah, it's been a pleasure. And all right, we'll see you all tomorrow at um 9 30 a.m. Uh thank you guys so much for joining the, us. This has been such a powerful panel. Um, please uh, oh everyone's thank you. I was gonna say please throw your thanks in the uh chat for all the panelists. And oh my gosh, people love you. You guys are oh. celebrities. Look at that. Uh Tim. Yeah. Thank yes. you so very much. Thank you for, so very much for allowing me to be on this panel, Tim and Melanie. Uh, it was an honor serving with you guys on this panel, and I'm looking forward to serving on future panels with you guys as well. Most yeah, certainly. Yeah, we couldn't have had a better uh, facilitator. Becton, you rock, brother. You rock, man. Brother, we all rock. Every <laughs> single last one of us on this panel, because we're standing in our power and standing in the truth for the sake of our own sakes. So it's just the way we're doing this together. And as Amen, veterans, brother. we Amen. have to look at yeah, ourselves appreciate together. appreciate everything. You guys are awesome. All right, Thank so you guys. remember, Thank tomorrow you. the panels are going to be, um, oh, to come back tomorrow so Brent can sing for you. Remember, Brent will be singing tomorrow, and um, the panels are disenfranchised veterans so, and people that don't self-identify as veterans, as well as um, community building. That's what we're going to end off on. So we'll see you all tomorrow. Thank you guys so much. One for being time here. again. Um, 9.30 a.m. is when it starts, Sandra. Okay. Yeah, um, and we welcome you all back. Thank you guys so much. Use our same Thank, links, you. Right? Thank you. Thank bye you. Bye-bye. Sending an email to you all. We need to stay connected this. Yes. Us. Yes. <laughs> okay. Yes, yes. Uh, Latoya, 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 um, excuse me if I'm pronouncing that wrong. I may be 